Hello and welcome to Walk the Talk Show with Waylon Lewis, yours truly, your host, and I'm honored to be here today with a longtime friend, Alana Kaivalia. I just got her name down, uh, her <laughs> last name down, right? Because I usually uh, call her sister. Obviously. Yeah. Yeah. So Alana is the, uh, this is your second book, this right? This is my second book, yeah. Author of Sacred Sound. I'm holding up this beautiful book from New World Library, and we're going to get into a lot of juicy issues like how yoga is broken, mm -hmm. how it can be fixed, does it need to be fixed, how yoga is wonderful, the impact of yoga on Western culture. Yep. What else? Kirtan. A little bit of Kirtan, a little bit of mantra. Kirtan mantra, we're going to be singing and myth, chanting. A little bit of history. Um, why it's horrible to do Kirtan if you have no idea what you're doing. <laughs> um, what Only else? for you, Waylon. Only for me. Yeah. Yeah, for everyone else, it's cool if you do it and you have no idea what you're doing. Um, it's not cultural appropriation. Don't worry about not it. Not at all. And what else? And yoga university kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yoga teachers and how maybe they can make a living. Learn a little bit more about yoga. Increase the scholarship. Make sure that we're accountable for all of the things that we teach others. Um, that and more. So we're going to just begin with a uh, bow. Um, I'll lead you all through that. And then Alana has agreed to lead us in something. A little chant or song or meditation. Sounds good. Or prayer. So for the bow, um, even though it's very simple, it's, it's um, quite powerful and important and ordinary. So you just take a good posture, root your tush, connect with the principle of the earth, it's the realm of details, solidity, softness. And then connect your head with the principle of the heavens. That's the realm of ideas, vision, mission, love. Your heart in between joins both, and you can offer, um, when we offer the bow, you can offer it with a sense of respect for Alana for joining us, as well as for your own life, your own mission, and the details that make that mission happen. So thank you very much. Give it away. All right. So as we're sitting here quietly, Turn your focus to your breath and see if you can hear a subtle sound of the breath. You may wish to constrict your throat just a little bit in order to increase the audible sound. This will help to direct your attention to the forefront of your mind. And in doing so, I'd love to offer a mantra. It's a simple mantra for peace. It asks for happiness and freedom for everyone everywhere. Loka Samasta Sukhi no bhavantu. Namaste, Waylon. Mm, that was great. <laughs> so I noticed you said mantra. Yeah, of course. Mantra. I do what I can. Yeah, so you're yeah. trying to say things correctly. Yeah, I think that it helps to, like I said, increase the scholarship and uh, educate people. People don't know how to say things correctly unless we as teachers actually do that. Yeah, it was funny. I grew up in the Buddhist community, and there's certain words we say, and we're taught how to say them. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I won't name the yoga studio, but there used to be a yoga studio here. The name of it was a Buddhist word, and it was mispronounced. Nice. Which was just classic <laughs> boulder. So um, that's a good, um, even though it's sort of a silly thing, it's a good entrance into sound being sacred. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, I, I guess I've known you for a long time, like... About 12 or 13 years. Yeah. Yeah. We did an interview, I don't even know if it ever got finally edited or recorded, like in the Boulder Shambhala Center. Yeah, that's right. Oh my yeah. gosh, that and was I've ages ago. Wow. I think we had a problem with the camera. I, I think remember. we did. I think Was that for my first book? It was like 10 years ago, <laughs> at least. <laughs> it was so a long time before. ago. And then you wrote an article back when Elephant was Yoga in the Rockies. Yeah, that I was actually, the first time I was ever published was in Yoga in the Rockies. Yes. yes. We've been um, at it for a long thought, time, man. <laughs> now you've moved on to have this viral article about, what was it? Um, well, I write a lot online, and for you too. Yes. yes. Um, but so, I recently had a viral article yeah. where I challenged Lululemon and their bad behavior, and I asked their founder, Chip Wilson, to kiss my big fat yoga ass. And 
And what did he? <laughs> yeah. um, well, he never reached out to me. I did recently do a panel for Yoga Journal in New York City. Right, with Sean Korn and all those people? That's right. right cool. And I was on it. Karen and Kelly or yep. something? I was talking with them about that. Yep, that's cool. right. And um, they invited me to be on it. And of course, I was a vocal uh, member of that particular panel. But I did get to meet the new CEO, Lauren Podavin. And I compiled about 100 pages of complaints and rants from teachers who are yoga students, yoga people. That people. probably took five minutes. It, <laughs> There's so many complaints. It took a little yeah. longer than that, but yeah. I brought it all together in a binder and I handed it to him and I said, look, this is your homework. If you want to know what people are really feeling about Lululemon, this is where right. it's written. Right. So uh, we're kind of all over the place, but this is what we want to talk about, which is yeah. sort of the intersection of yoga, this ancient or perhaps not so ancient. Depends. And we'll get into that. Yep. Tradition. Um, with Western culture, which is yeah. a kind of consumer, for better and worse, a consumer-driven culture. Mm -hmm. So yoga combined with uh, America has obviously like blossomed and caught fire. It's this amazing kind of chemical reaction. Yeah. But it's really changing yoga. Um, we were talking about my conversation with um, Yoga Alliance, mm -hmm. with the CEO, uh, before we started recording. And Yoga Alliance, like the guiding organization supposedly for yoga culture isn't really certifying anything or main, making sure the standards are good or, or not good. That's correct. They're, what are they doing? They're a registry. They're a registry. They, right. they don't do anything for actual accountability. Um, I've, uh, in my long time as a yoga teacher now, I've written fully five different teacher training programs for some of the largest companies in the country and registered them with Yoga Alliance and Yoga Alliance has never checked Right. As to whether we're actually teaching what we say we are. So entrepreneurs out there, if you want a cool business model, <laughs> find a burgeoning community, start a registry, <laughs> take dues every year. And apparently you'll make $3.37 million. Which is what they're making Which a year. is what they make per year. Right. And they've never, ever actually checked in on me. I mean, and so I feel like... I know, and they should. They I mean, should totally check in on me. Place. I'm yeah. all over the place. But yeah. even so, you know, I, I've, I feel like there's a time for us to take up uh, our own personal accountability and responsibility because no one is doing it for us right wow. now. And those of us who really care about yoga, which um, includes me for sure, those of us who really care about yoga need to make a stand and start really standing up for yoga and not for the commodification of yoga, not for the yoga pants, not for um, things be being done in a quick, fast, cheap way. Yeah, when you search, is interesting when I search for yoga topics to write about if I can't think of something, mm -hmm. um, uh, yoga pants is the number one Google <laughs> thing always, and it's so interesting. You're like, okay, so by and it's by far the number one, like by a factor wow. of eight hundred. Okay. So you're like, okay, so the impact of yoga culture is on pants. the U.S. has been like what college girls wear <laughs> and what, pants. Nice. what twelve year old boys search for on Google. Right. Okay. Wow, I did not know that. That is a shocking fact, Waylon. <laughs> it's kind of not that shocking. I mean, sex sells, but um, sure. Uh, unless you ask Don Draper, who says sex doesn't sell. It's very interesting, but we don't have time for that. So I wish we did. I love Don Draper. He's, he's sexy. amazing. Yeah, well, totally. He's, so his assistant at the time in Mad Men says, "Well, you know, sex sells." Like she's Peggy Olson. Yeah. She's like frustrated about some account not some advertising campaign not working. Uh -huh. She's like, "Well, we should have gone with sex or something." Yeah. Sex sells. And he's like in his Don Draper way with like utter confidence and like completely grounded. He's yeah. like, who said that? You know, sex doesn't sell. What sells is a dream. What se sells is, um, you know, anyway. Well, actually, there's a quote out there. I great. mean, I would love for that, I think, in this regard to be true. Frankly, you know, I um, I see a lot of glossy filtered photos on Instagram of very bendy poses. Yeah. And that seems to be what yoga is looking like for us. And I think that that's... It's really shortchanging what yoga is capable of. And I've gone the super non-sexy route of trying to go with the education, the philosophy, the mythology, trying to teach people what is really um, grounding and transformational in yoga. And it doesn't have a glossy Instagram filter. Well, this is why I'm so excited about having you on here because you've been tweeting um, uh, and you're creating apps and all this stuff. Like I wanted to talk about that. You're not sure. too cool for using American culture to support right. learn yoga and kirtan learning or uh, 
Kirtan, as I like to say. <laughs> or Curtin. Or Mantra. Yeah, Curtin. <laughs> Curtin, yeah. yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, was so the very first Yoga Journal conference, which I love, mm -hmm. I'm not even trying to be nice, I legitimately respect those conferences. Absolutely. The very first I do one, too. Yeah, yeah. The very first one I went to, uh, I was at, you know, like the Friday night or whatever when they were sure. the lectures and stuff. Yeah. And it was great. Whoever was talking was great. And then suddenly, like, some people are playing some weird music, and all these, like, white yuppie people rushed the stage, sat down, and started rocking back and forth, like, blissed out. And I was like, I am in some sort of, like, new age nightmare. And I literally... <laughs> <laughs> like you slipped into an alternate universe. <laughs> it was Krishna Das. It was actually we nice. talked about that. Nice. Was, we talked about that exact night on yeah. on Walk the Talk Show recently. Actually, twice. He's sick of talking about it. But it's interesting that you know, basically, Americans is like a fast food spiritual culture. So sure. as long as we can get high off of kirtan, yeah. we don't really care to learn about it. What irritates me about it, coming from a Buddhist point of view, is the spiritual materialism, that people don't know what they're doing, or even really care. They just want the joy. I, I completely agree. And, um, you know, I feel like, number one, there's something so key and critical about making things accessible, about giving people access to good quality stuff. And on the other side, those of us who are giving access to the yoga, to the kirtan, to the mantra, need to make sure that we're doing a good job at presenting it in a really authentic and grounded, transformational, um, scholarly way. And, and that's, that's what like your whole book is dedicated to, right? It's absolutely. It's explaining what's behind kirtan or mantra. That's right. And um, I used the correct Sanskrit. I made sure and went through the Sanskrit diacriticals. Um, I fought with the publisher a little bit on that. They wanted me to just spell it out. And I said, no, there's an actual way to do this. And people won't learn if we don't present it to them this way. So I think that it's well, a... credit it's a, to them for... Uh, yeah, they were, they were amazing about it. Yeah. They worked hard to make sure everything yeah, was correct. Yeah, like, we were just talking about New World. They're awesome. Yeah. So um, it's a twofold problem, you know, where we have to give access to people so that they can find it, but once they find it, it needs to be really grounded and well, um, well researched, well scholarshiped. And what I've noticed in the spiritual community, I am, I'm right now pursuing my PhD at Pacifica in mythology, and so my big hero is Joseph Campbell. Um, and this, I'm sure some of the viewers and listeners have heard about his hero's journey. And it's a cycle of transformation, essentially. So he talks about how any person going on any journey, and spiritual would be the one that we're talking about, they have to leave what they've once known. So they have to like get out of their comfort zone a little bit. They have to go through a transformational process. But the thing that I find missing in the spiritual community is that they don't return. They don't come back. So they just want to get lost in the feel good of it. They want to get lost in kind of the high of it, in the yoga pants of it, in the sparkles and bindis and butterflies of it, as opposed to really returning and grounding back to where they came from and bringing it back to their community in a way that they can share it with everybody else. That's so interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Thanks. <laughs> I, have no, I have no comment on that. I've thought a lot about it, Waylon. Well, it's great uh, because I yeah. feel like it's almost the opposite, but we're saying the same thing, where people never even truly leave. I think they do because, yeah. I mean, I've led over 100 teacher trainings in my lifetime at this point, yeah. and I can't tell you how many times I see people get divorced, move house, quit their job, change their career, and literally move, walk away from the life that they started out with, yeah. and they're not able to reintegrate. But you there's know? the bubble effect where the people who go to your teacher trainings maybe are looking for something different than the people who, like, I, my retort would be, I can't tell you how many times I've seen people speeding in their Lexus SUV mm. in Boulder to get to yoga class with their plastic mat, which causes cancer and <laughs> harms sea life, in their plastic Lululemon clothes, which is Made bad of petroleum, for yeah. yeah. Um, who go into yoga to work on their yoga butt. And yes, it's a, I'm talking about a cliche, but you know we all go sure. through that. We get speedy and aggressive, and we want to look good. Yeah. And how often do we actually come back to the breath, or or alignment is lost in most yoga <sighs> studios today? Sure. I mean, I would say you know it's what's more important. Uh, uh, what's more important than the alignment of the body is the alignment of the spirit the alignment of your intentions with the thing that you're actually trying to do. And I, I hmm. you know, there is there is a there is a yoga butt. Like, that does exist, but that's not all there is. And I feel like if we only lead people to the glossy Instagram filtered images of what yoga is, and if that's, if that's the only representation they're getting, how do they even know 
what's possible through yoga? How do they even know that it can actually change their life, change their mind, stop them from speeding, help them in their family, help them in their career, um, allow them to reintegrate their spiritual practice in such a way that it makes their entire life better as opposed to yeah. trying to get out of the life that they're in and make everything different. I it's not, a, it's not an escapist route. Yoga is not a yoga is not escapism. Yeah, it's hard work. It's very hard work. But I love that what you just said is like there's a full meal to be had. Yeah. You can actually transform your life. You can, you can. actually transform your life. I remember when yeah. I was 17 or 18, I went to college and I had grown up in the Buddhist community and had meditation all around me and I'd sure. done plenty and I'd done all I had actually completed this big thing and I'd gone to like these like little seminary colleges um but it wasn't until I went to college and just got kind of miserable, you know, and insecure and, <laughs> yeah. like, um, humbled, really. And I went back and I did a Buddhist weekend of meditation. Actually, mm -hmm. it was Shambhala, which isn't Buddhist, but it was basic meditation. And I remember walking outside and just being present for the first mm -hmm. time in months. And the flowers, mm -hmm. everything was so vivid, you know. Sure. Um, not in a trippy way. And, like, uh, it's actually that way all the time. And yeah. I haven't been looking. I've been lost in my mind. And saying, wow, this stuff actually works. It actually works. And, you know, I had a similar experience, and I'd like to add something to it. Is, um, I've been doing yoga for about seven years, very intensely. The meditation, the asana, all of the things that you're supposed to do with yoga. And I realized that I was basically still an asshole. Uh -huh. You know, I was definitely that person speeding along in my, in my car um, on C470, get, trying uh -huh. to get to my own yoga class to teach it. And I realized something was wrong. I was missing something. And that's when I started to delve into... Um, modalities that access the unconscious, which actually yoga does not. Hmm. Um, so yoga isn't a silver bullet either. And I think that there is a way for us to, with our our current knowledge of how the mind works, of how psychology works, um, and now of how yoga is working for us to create an even better kind of uh, way to access the principles of yoga. So um, I'm actually trying to do this. I want to, I mean, yoga is broken. Yoga is broken right now in America. Yeah, there, you've been hashtagging yeah, that ironically. Yeah, there, like. there are pieces of it found in the classes that we take. There are pieces of it in the magazines we read. There are pieces of it in the yoga pants we wear, but it's not fully there. It is somewhere and it's present, right. but we've got to reassemble it. And so this is something that I'm actually endeavoring to do in a really real way. Great. Yeah. Well, I mean, to be fair to Yoga Alliance, so um, I don't know if you saw our video, but I do feel like Richard Carpell, the new CEO, is actually – working to do that in a genuine way. I think they are, they have been beyond broken. They've been kind of just like well, not they're, even... They're arbitrary. Much. Right. It, it, but it, does, it still doesn't have, it's still a registry. It's not going right. to be a sense of accountability and it's not going to be accreditation. Right. And we've got between... And yeah, you were talking about the difference with massage therapists. Yeah, massage therapists whose bodies don't even move. They lay on the table, have um, about... I think I read 325 hours of practical hands-on and anatomy training. Mm -hmm. 325 hours, and that's in order to become uh, certified and credentialed in 39 states in this country. And yoga, yoga Alliance only requires 20 hours of anatomy. That's not enough. We're moving bodies in extraordinary ways, and we as yoga teachers have got to be educated in how those bodies move. Yeah. Now, I know plenty of yoga teachers who have done their work and gone through anatomy trainings and gotten those hours, but Yoga Alliance doesn't register that, and there's no way to tell who has that information and who doesn't. And I think the yoga student deserves to know who has that level of training and who yeah. doesn't. And yeah. I think the yoga teacher deserves to show whether they have that level of training or not. So, it's so interesting, though. The yoga community on Elephant, um, which is avid and passionate and loving of this path, mm -hmm. is so knee-jerk defensive. Like when those New York Times articles come out, they're like, you know, yoga will break your body or whatever it is. Um, yeah. You know, you're having a strong <laughs> expression right now. What's going on? I have zero poker face. It's terrible. That's great. Um, yeah, yoga can break your body. I did a very yeah. dedicated daily Thank asana you. I you were practice. Be like, I hate those articles. No, no, I did a very dedicated daily yoga practice for over ten years, and I was like Humpty Dumpty, who had yeah. to put myself back together yeah. again. I've had procedures on all of the major joints of my body wow. because it 
basically just ripped me apart. I yeah. feel like a retired professional athlete at this well, point. Especially hot yoga, and this isn't a diss on hot yoga. Sure. It can be done in a beautiful, wonderful way if you have good alignment. Everything can. If you have good alignment and breath and all that. But even if and you it, don't, you're yeah. still doing motions repetitively. Yeah. And that's going to cause wear and tear on certain joints. Yoga is not the good silver thing I bullet. I only do one class a week. So. <laughs> <laughs> at least you're consistent, Waylon. At least you're consistent. More. But, I mean, I, I feel like personally, you know, there are so many people who are wonderful at their asana practice, and there are so many teachers who are incredible and meticulous asana technicians. So I really feel like that part is being, it's going to be handled. Um, and my work is in the future to move actually away from asana and focus a lot more on the philosophy, the psychology, the mm. mythology. And um, I go to school at Pacifica Graduate Institute, and it's a place that is incredibly sympathetic to people in the yoga community. And I'm going to be working with them to create create a program that involves yoga and allows people to access an accredited program with the education they need to actually help people transform and eventually to become a licensed counselor and marriage and family therapist so that they have the accredited body, they have the substantive knowledge, mm -hmm. they've had access to the yoga and the philosophy in a way that we can actually track and prove that they know these things and they'll have the ability to help people properly because they've got the education to do so. So I'm excited to roll this out to the yoga community and present it to them. Um, it's going to be my thesis and dissertation, uh -huh. and uh, I'm working hard, man. I cool. mean, I'm passionate about yoga, and I want to give people something that they can really latch on to. Um, yeah, I mean, that's walking your talk. You're actually, like, creating the stuff that we're, we've been complaining that there's an absence of. Yeah, so that's great. exactly. I mean, Naropa University has done something like that. Um, to give them credit, maybe some other places have. You, have yeah, Loyola that. Marymount University also has a yoga studies program, but I'm okay. looking more. I'm looking not just for yoga studies because right now we've got forty to seventy thousand yoga teachers in America who make on average thirty-five thousand dollars a year, which is not a living wage. And where where does that number come from? Yoga Alliance. Okay. They're registered with Yoga Alliance. That's right. how we. That's how we know and can track them. And frankly. And is that. But there's no way of knowing if they're full-time or part-time or what. Right? Um, the statistics show that they make on average of $35,000 a year if they're full-time as a if yoga full -time. teacher. Yeah, wow. so, which means even less if they're part-time. So, right. you know, and, and I know that every yoga teacher has had this experience where a, a student comes out of class afterward and says, oh, my God, you know, do you have time for tea? Can we talk? Because I'm going through this problem or that problem or this other thing in my life. And, you know, they see us as spiritual leaders. And I know that every yoga teacher comes from a place of wanting to help and wanting to serve people, um, and I would love to give them the ability to say, absolutely, you can make an appointment at my office, I'd love to see you this week, oh, and by the way, I take insurance. So that they have the ability to counsel people through their problems with yoga as their background, and they're accredited and trained to do so. So explain what you just said. I mean, so what you're saying is yoga teachers right now cannot take insurance. There, there's no accreditation or way for them to take insurance, as far right. as I know. Unlike acupuncture, or acupuncture can take insurance. Or... Counselors and psychologists Counselors. can take it, take insurance, and that's the route that I'm going in. So, if yoga teachers became certified, uh, counselors and therapists. Yeah, psychotherapists or whatever. Yeah, counselor. They, yeah, counselors. Yeah. Okay, I don't know. It's okay. Marriage and family therapy. I don't go to therapy because I don't. Know <laughs> So I don't know Obviously. Terms. Yeah, <laughs> Why fine. would you? It's Life fine. It's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. I do some kirtan and <laughs> Mantra. 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 Yeah. yeah. Um, so let's talk about kirtan. Let's do it. So since so, what is there that people aren't connecting with beyond the just sort of once in a while you sit down at a party, mm -hmm. party, yeah. at a yoga <laughs> studio, and you rock back and forth and you sing ecstatically? Mm -hmm. What are they missing? Well, what I hope they're not missing is some connection to source, spirit, self, whatever you want to call it. Um, that really is the purpose of kirtan. That's why the practice was created in around the ninth century. It's um, a practice of bhakti yoga, which is the yoga of love or devotion, and it's a way to call out to a certain aspect or quality. Or deity. Or deity. Yeah. And you, by doing so, you put your attention on that. Mm -hmm. And whatever you put your attention on is what you become. So if you spend 45 minutes chanting, let's say, to Krishna, you're going to start to take on the qualities of Krishna. Just as you and Red, your dog, have spent so much time together, you guys are kind of looking alike. Yeah. That's what happens. I'm getting hairier every year. <laughs> yeah. So when you put your attention on something, you start to take on those qualities, and that, that's kind of the purpose of both. But only if you know what you're putting your attention on. No. Interestingly, the... 
The power I'm waiting. I'm open-minded. <laughs> sure. Um, the power of the language of Sanskrit is that it is vibrational. Uh -huh. So unlike English, whereas like we call this a blanket because we agree to call it a blanket, it's a label. Whatever the Sanskrit name for blanket is would express blanketness. It's right. the essence of the blanket. So encoded within the vibration of the language itself is the meaning and the feeling of it. So that's why when even I and maybe you first started chanting Kirtan with people like Krishna Das, we felt something different. Yeah, I and felt we revulsion. Didn't... Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a feeling nonetheless. But you do feel something yeah. different, and that's what people are feeling. They're connecting to something, but they don't know what it is. The reason I wrote the book is because I want to empower them with the knowledge of what it is. Because Why I, bother? Because I think get the vibration. Because I think it will help to direct their intention even more clearly. Yes, that's that's. So we're more or less on the same page. Yeah. Maybe less, but <laughs> but I mean, from a Buddhist point of view, it's incredible. It's not only insulting and improper to do things that you haven't bothered to learn. Sure. About. Um, it's ineffective. You're getting the fumes of the joy, okay. but there's so much more in Krishna. Yeah. And in like what I love about Richard Freeman at Yoga Workshop is you go and chant all this stuff. Yeah. And I have no idea what I'm saying, but I do because he brings out. He tells you what it sheets, is. Sheets, and yeah. you can actually read it. And then if you don't know what it is, he does lectures. Maybe not that often anymore, but he does lectures, and you can you know ask and you can learn. And then he has books. So, well, I think that that's the appropriate way to go, yeah. and I think that that's the responsibility of the teacher. But I don't want to diminish the experiences that people have had, just you know, because something has to hook you, right? Somebody has to go to their first kirtan at some point, and in yeah. doing so, if they feel something good and they want to pursue it further, yeah. I, they need to have the means to access it. So they're going to feel something. If they don't pursue it further, you're right. I think that they will be just gaining the fumes of whatever it is. They're not going to be unlocking the potency and the potential of what the practice can actually do for them. Yeah. I mean, to me, it's like, you know, having traveled some of the Buddhist path, which is, as you were saying with yoga, is like really hard, it's really hard, challenging. Yeah. It actually transforms Yoga things. is not easy. Right, is that, yes, it, it is valid for someone, a first-timer, to go into kirtan and just feel that joy, and if that's all they ever do... It's a start. It's a start if, if they there's a finish. It. Yeah. If there's that's nothing more than a start ever, yeah. then that's all it is. And sure. that's not a bad thing, but, um, you know, if you want to get all, like, college studies about it, you could call it cultural appropriation, you could call it spiritual materialism... You know, there's so much more. Just yeah. to be positive about it, there's so much more. It's sort of like saying, you know, kissing someone when you're like 12. You're like, oh my God, that was amazing. I'm in love. And then if that's all you ever did, well, wow, you could make love. You could fall in love. You could have your heart broken. You could get married. You could have children. You know, there's so sure. much more. So I'm not saying the 12 year old kiss in the bus is like a bad thing. It's but a there's start. There's so much more. It's a start, and there is so much more. And I'm certainly going to do my part to and give people as yeah. much more as I can. Well, you're doing it. That's why. Thanks, yeah. I wanted to have you on. <laughs> Thanks, Colin. Um, so can we be personal for a minute? I didn't even really know, um, I don't think, having known you for so long, that you really know what you're talking about when you're talking about the vibration of sound. I do. I was born with a hearing impairment. I was born with a cleft palate. And um, it's, a, it's a hole in the yeah. opening of the roof of the mouth. Yeah. And when they closed it at 14 months, I immediately lost quite a lot of my hearing. Um, Why does that affect hearing? Because your like your ear, nose, and throat are all connected. So oh. when they pull the musculature and everything together, it oh. basically creates like a negative suction in your. I don't. I don't wow. know honestly the medical sort of thing that so happens. I've never but, known this ever. You seem yeah. to. You can hear. I can read your lips. Um, I so wear hearing aids. Are you reading aids. lips? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So if I put my hand over my mouth, is that bad? It would. Yes. Okay. Because yeah. I was kind of doing this. No, no, you're okay. Okay. You're okay. Um, so I read lips. I wear hearing aids. And when I was a little girl, my doctors told my mother that I would never, ever be musical and that she should just get me into soccer or something. And my mom is actually an accomplished accordionist. And she was like, not my daughter. Hmm. And so as soon as I could sit up tall, she strapped an accordion to my chest and taught me how to play. And hmm. then she always taught me how to sing. And, and I was good, like, vibration with that. Totally, right into the chest cavity. Uh -huh. And I was in choir every year growing up. And honestly, wow. 
I, I never even realized I was different. My parents did a really good job of just, I was an only child, I was just like everybody else. They didn't even really mention to me that I had a hearing impairment. Mm -hmm. My dad used to wake me up on Sunday mornings by playing Phantom of the Opera on the, on the stereo below me, because um, my room was on the second floor and I could feel the vibrations of the music and he used to challenge me. Um, oh, you didn't have your hearing aids? In no, the night, not, yeah, you don't sleep with them. Uh -huh. so, so you couldn't hear but you could hear, feel the And vibration. I didn't actually get hearing aids until I was 21. Wow. I was 21 years old before Just I three heard. Years ago. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. I was 21 before I heard for the first time the sound of leaves blowing in the wind. Wow. I didn't even know that it happened. I never heard it. The sound of my grandmother's voice behind me. I was 21 years old. And when so that's so powerful that you're able to teach kirtan well, and. Yeah, I mean, I honestly, I went, I went backwards. I was shocked to realize that people don't have that relationship to sound. Like, how can you not feel it? Oh, I like, see. Like, what's going on here? Like, you don't have a vibrational access oh. to it, and so since oh, so I like do, it's easier for you. Yeah. You're like Superman. This thing <laughs> happened to you, and now you're like more powerful. It's like my superpower. It oh. is absolutely. So it's so, not an inspiring. It's not story inspiring at all. It's totally obstacles. lame. No. It's, it's more like Superman coming down to Earth to teach. It's us actually like your inspiring time. story because if I can make you feel vibration, yeah. Waylon, then yeah. I've done my job. I'm an idiot. <laughs> true. No, I mean, it's true. Um, yeah, I mean, I love singing, but... Yeah. Um, so, well, we covered that. That's amazing. Thank you. Um, so, I have some notes. Can I read my notes? Yes. All right. They say lots of stuff. Do you want, the first line is, Kirshan irritates me. I think we covered that. These are just my personal No, that's great. I want to talk about spiritual materialism, Kirtan. You're helping folks learn what it's actually about. Yeah. Not that they give a shit. <laughs> well, hopefully they give a shit and they'll buy my book and like give yeah. more of a shit. No, I mean, this is, <laughs> and I would say, I mean, this is like a quality publisher, a quality uh, thing to do. I haven't read it yet, but now I have the book. So. Well, you're going to have to read it. Well, and I can give you, I mean, basically, I went through and I found in the book, I went through and I, I found where all of these mantras come from, can't come from. I sourced them. And so I tell you the text that they come from. I tell you the context in which they appear. I give you an accurate translation. I give you both the actual Sanskrit as well as the transliteration as well as the translation. I give you the mythology, so the story around wow. which it appears, and I give you how it actually applies to your personal practice. Yoga University should put this on their textbook list. Um, it's already on the list, don't worry. Awesome. Go to Pacifica, you'll find all about it. So here's a challenging question, which I prepared you for, so it's not that I can't challenging. Wait. Which is, so part of the criticism of like Instagram yoga, you know, yeah. is like every yoga teacher and their mother or their sister is creating their own like TM, <laughs> like Waylon Yoga TM. Do you not have that yet? You should no, totally have that. <laughs> no one would follow my, if they saw my Instagram yoga poses. Oh God. No yeah, one, let's not start doing no that No one way. would be inspired. Um, maybe some guys like myself would be inspired, but. Maybe. It's really hard. As Richard Freeman says, you know, beginner, beginner types who do yoga um, are doing more yoga often than more advanced because it's so challenging. We're yeah. like in that um, place where we have to breathe, we have to be fully present. Exactly. But um, So you yourself created your own brand of yoga. Yeah. You're developing two apps. You're writing books. You're traveling, teaching at yoga journal conferences uh -huh. and whatever else. Yeah. Like how are you not part of the consumer machine of yoga? Well, again, I'm trying to be accessible. I know how people access information, and my job is to provide the best quality information I can through those access points. So, you know, if people are using apps to find yoga, I want to give them a really good one. If people are using um, books to find yoga or I Kindle you said books, if people are using apps to find yoga. Oh God! Like, well, no, no, I'm I'm pretty sure I didn't say that, but you yeah, know, no. whatever works, Sorry. man. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I was just thinking about yoga, but yeah. No, sure, but I, I, you know, I want to use those accessibility time. points to give people access to really good quality yoga, and it might, you know, I, ha I hate to think of it this way. It makes me sad. Like, it might be less sexy. You know, like, I don't post mm. photos on Instagram of myself in bendy poses because I don't feel like people need to see that. I would rather people pick up my book and find, you know, the actual sources and lead people to where they can find the actual sources or lead people to where they can find the actual transformation. And they're yeah. accessing it through these things, so it's, it's sort of like a love-hate relationship. I can't, if I want to get that information out there, I have to get it out there in the way that people are, are finding it. Yeah, it's so it's funny we brought up that Don Draper quote because it's sort of, 
perfect for this conversation, which yeah. is that people think they want sex and bendy yoga and la 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 la, and sure we do, but what we actually want is to be happy and we want to be present and we want to be loved. And I would we say we want connection. We want connection. Yeah. And, you know, that's appealing to the better part of human nature, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of beautiful. It is. And, you know, I, I just hope that the people who want to get there find it. And I want to make it as easy for them to find it as I can. Yeah. That's great. Thanks. Get in there. Drop the mic. Walk <laughs> off. Walks off. <laughs> um, so... Uh, We've covered like all this. Oh, we were Let's gonna talk, talk about, about asana. Well, I also want to talk oh. just a little bit more about why you say yoga is broken. Well, that's so interesting to me. Such yeah. an interesting phrase. It is an interesting phrase, and it's been something. You know, it, it. I feel reluctant to say it because I know people will feel offended. But I think that that's kind of where we're coming from. Is that you know th those of us who really care about yoga and its source and what it can actually do for people, and and I don't even want to name that because it's personal what it does for you, each individual person. Um, it's being lost in the commodification of yoga. It's being lost in you know, the lack of accountability, the lack of accreditation. It's being lost in sort of the whitewashed aspect of yoga and just sort of the pretty pictures. Yeah. Um, and I, and also the cult of personality thing. Uh, yeah. yeah, true. When, and I want to get it back. You know, I want, or at least I want to to help to get it back or to show people that we can piece it back together because the, the one place where yoga does exist in its entirety is inside you, mm -hmm. inside each and every one of us as individuals. Mm -hmm. And it, it requires us to look inside, which is hard. It's hard to look inside. But that's where we have to look. And right now we're looking outward to Lululemon pants. We're looking outward to those glossy photos. We're looking outward to those cults of personality. And yoga is only appearing to us in pieces. So what are a few specific things that yoga-loving yoga yogi people can do to connect with yoga inside as opposed to outside? Um, I could offer one if you yeah, want. Yeah, no, I mean, I, the first thing that comes to mind is do a home practice. Uh -huh. You know, get, cool. get, out, get, out of the, get out of the limelight. Get out of the demonstrations of asanas. Get out of the, hmm. you know, the my pants are better than your pants. Just do it at home. Do it not in front of a mirror. Just... Feel it Without for yourself. Without your iPhone taking photos. Of Without your, your iPhone. Poses. I don't want to see your daily meditation practice. Like, just fucking meditate. Yeah. You know, just do it. Yeah. Stop talking about it. Just do your practice. Yeah. That would be the first thing that comes to mind. Cool. The second thing that comes to mind would be do your research. Make sure, in the Yoga Sutra, it says that the most valued form of knowledge is personal experience. So even if a yoga teacher tells you something, it's not yours until you know it yourself. You have got to look this stuff up. Hmm. Just because a yoga teacher says this is the way to do the alignment, nobody knows what alignment is. Nobody knows exactly how it's supposed to be. We're hmm. literally making it up as we go along. So it has to be the right alignment for you. And the only way you're going to know that is if you do it. Somebody says this is your mantra, the only way you're going to know that is if you chant it and figure that out. And it might not be. You might have to find a different one. But you're going to have to know that for yourself. And that takes a lot of personal accountability, diligence, and practice. That was good. So Thanks. that's, what is that, <laughs> two or three? Uh, personal practice, like home practice, and I would say learning. personal experience learning. Personal experience. Svadhyaya. I mean, it's Svadhyaya is the yoga term. What or does that the Sanskrit term. Like own experience? Yeah, it's self-study. But it's uh -huh. the self in which, you know, for a while we seek outward because we don't know what we're doing. So for a while we have to have a teacher or books or go to classes and we start figuring it out. But at some point we've got to make that U-turn where we start to look inside for the answers mm -hmm. and figure it out for ourselves. And that's where the real value of yoga comes. Hmm. Yeah, I think, I mean, we, we've also all gone through that, like me and my dumb way when I'm in a class for the like 80th time with the same teacher who I love and mm -hmm. I finally get something. Mm -hmm. It's when I'm finally processing and connecting, like mm -hmm. you were saying, yeah. with that teaching. Yeah. Um, uh, so we have a couple questions, audience questions. Oh, fine. Should I jump into that? Oh, I was going to say, sorry, can I add one to the yoga Please. thing? So I find there's a disconnect when we're trying to practice yoga, but we, but it's, you know, Sean Korn was on the show recently talking about off the mat. Mm -hmm you know, when it's all for us, when yoga becomes oh, something gosh. that's for other people and for the benefit of the world. And that's why I'm so irritated. And uh, to put it in a more positive way, I wish Lululemon, which is helping set the 
culture of yoga in, in, in an aspirational. <laughs> no, <they're not. laughs> Don't well, say that maybe way. not in a positive way, but I mean, their advertising budget, their ads, their clothes. I mean, they're every commodifying sort of, our well-being and selling it back to us. Yes, but they're setting the and tone. And they're skewing it. I'm not saying it's good or bad. Okay. I am saying they're setting the tone. Okay. If they would start making organic clothes that were made out of um, natural materials instead of petroleum and whatever, mm -hmm. um, if yoga people stopped bringing plastic bottles into yoga class, if yoga people started caring about our environment and our animal life and our ocean life and our other people who are less fortunate, mm -hmm. and many do. I think many do care about it, and I think we need more vocal people taking action about those things. Yeah, I mean, I feel like every co interview I'm ever in, people are like, yeah, everyone cares about it. And then I go, I literally am going to yoga in like an hour or two. Yeah. And then I go there, there's like 80 plastic bottles. It's all Lululemon. Uh, and, you know, probably 90% of the people uh, drove, right? Yeah, right. We're in Boulder. <laughs> it's like you could walk in 10 minutes or you could drive yeah. in 10 minutes and then spend 10 minutes parking. Well, we need more vocal activists so we need better alternatives. You know, there are lots of companies out there doing good work. Lululemon yeah. isn't one of them at this time, in my estimation, and right. I've been very vocal about well, you that. You were just sure. on this panel at Yoga Journal with Sean and yep, and Carrie Kelly, Kelly and Natalia Petruzella and yeah. uh, Leslie Booker. Oh, and uh, Carol Horton. And Carol Horton. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So um, we'll get back to bitching about Lululemon after the break. Um, so we have a question in some foreign language. But okay. the word bullying, I recognize that. Do you speak that language? <laughs> it's not Sanskrit. I don't. I wish I did. Okay, here's a question I can read from Kerry Marzo. If the Yoga Alliance requirements are lacking, why do so many studios prefer teachers have the YA affiliation? Seems almost anyone who can afford it can do it. Does it mean they are truly qualified to teach? I don't know. Uh, I would say that it doesn't necessarily mean that they are truly qualified to teach. Um, and I think that yoga studios require it because it, it's all we have. There's, I mean, what else are they going to acquire? How else are they going to know that someone has anything? Um, you know, so it, it's, a, it's a little bit of a negative feedback loop at this point. Like, Yoga Alliance is just a registry. They don't ask, they don't ask for any it's accountability. It's just a start without a finish. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's yeah. more than nothing. It's, it's, and they are, you know, uh, adding the social whatever Well, it's thing. like Yelp. They're making it like Yelp. Yeah, well, let's not say Yelp because we all hate Yelp. Let's hope it's oh. better than that. But, yeah, I mean, they are adding this. But it's, it's the same kind yeah. of thing where yeah. someone who's gone through a teacher training program can go on and, and rate it. Right. Yeah. Uh-huh. So it's That'll solve it. <laughs> right. Problem solved. No. Yoga no I longer broken. Hashtag so. yoga fixed. <laughs> um, Hashtag yoga totally not fixed. <laughs> yeah. uh, anything else? We've covered a lot. We have covered a lot. Um, thank you for the opportunity for having me on the show, Waylon. It's really a yeah. pleasure. I it appreciate is a pleasure. It. Yeah. Yeah, you're one of the it's few people. It's been a long time in running, and, I, and it's so yeah. nice to be here with you again. Yeah, we'll stop logging on Huffington Post and get your ass get my ass on what I was saying. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, no, but seriously, this is so rare, uh, especially when people have apps and have books and have are professional teachers and this yeah. and that for people to be frank. And again, I, I do want to give some credit to Richard Carpell of. Yoga Alliance, I felt like he, good or bad, if people are satisfied or not, he was frank 100% in his video about what they're doing and not sure. and what they're trying to fix. So I do feel like if we give them, if we hold the space for them and, or maybe push the space for them to... Well, we have to su make good improve. suggestions as well. Like, we have to tell them what we need, and hopefully they can they can meet us. And right. in the meantime, I'll just be creating my... And offer solutions, program. like you're doing. Yeah. I mean, because it is hard. How do you certify... A million different yoga teacher trainings that all are different schools of yoga and different, you know. I mean, it's, it's tough. It's tough. It's not. A, it's not an easy problem. Yeah. But it's certainly one that you know. I hope to open up Pandora's box a little bit and start talking about like how do we do this? Because I do feel mm -hmm. like both the teachers and the students deserve far better at this point. They could just fly you to every single teacher training constantly all year long. I'm really expensive. They can't and do that. And you could say yes or no. No, I'm kidding. No, but you'd be expensive. But you just walk <laughs> in five minutes. Good. No. You're in. Well, a lot of I, bribing, you know. Sure, we bribing, absolutely. Lots uh, of bribing. I'll yeah, give you I'll a cut. 10%? Yeah. Sounds good? Idea. Totally. Yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> awesome. Well, Alana Kavalia. Kav Kav I'm just going to let you wrestle with that one for a second. Kav <laughs> Kavalia. And my website is alanak.com. 
L-A-N-N-A-K dot com. So you don't have to know how to yeah. spell Kaivalya. And I've got lots and lots of educational resources on there for teachers and students that are both free and paid, so you can get what you need. So we'll link that. We'll spell her name properly. We'll put the Yoga Alliance and any other yoga videos we've discussed, sure. uh, like Sean's, below in the same blog on Elephant Journal. Um, check out Alana and uh, check out the book, Sacred Sound. You can always find Walk the Talk Show on Instagram, at Walk the Talk Show, on SoundCloud, um, and on YouTube.com slash Waylon H. Lewis. And as always, thank you to Google Plus for the partnership.